It'll be a text file. Oh, you can yeah. read into a text file. So it's a text file. It's a plot text file. <laughs> so you do right click, save as, and then it's a text file, and then you can store it in your working directory. And then if, if you go along with the slides, you'll see how I read in a text file. Something we've done before, we've read in CSV files, we've read in Excel files, we've read in SPSS files, we've even read in, read in uh, .dat files, so like startup files, so R can read in any file as long as it's in a uh, relatively normal format. So that's just, uh, you don't need for the exercise, just if you wanted to code along, uh, because uh, as you, uh, that link has died. So I think I'll just, there might be a couple of people who are late still coming in. That's, I think we should just start and we'll see if they uh, show up. So last lecture was all about mediation. And we'll re return to mediation when we talk about structured equation models. But today is all about exploratory factor analysis, so skill building, uh, that type of thing. So I'm going to hopefully teach you a little bit about how to do a factor analysis in, uh, in R and how to visualize a factor analysis to some degree as well. And after today, so uh, I had uploaded all the, uh, all the files for the assignment, but I forgot to make them visible. But now everything you should in the assessment and submission folder see all the files now also for assignment two see the templates. And so if you wanted to, you could also start working on assignment, uh, on assignment two. So it's under assessment and submission, everything is, uh, is there. For the second one. For the second one, yeah. We moved on to the second one. Last week already. <laughs> yeah. Thing, things go fast when you're having a blast. No. <laughs> so <laughs> so if you wanted to, you could start. Uh, uh, so have any of you ever run a factor analysis? Is it something you've done? On SPSS. On SPSS? Yes. So it's a, uh, and what was the, the purpose? What was the type of thing you were trying to do? Johannes told you to. Johannes told you to. Uh, yeah, I think it was about personality. Uh, it was about personality. And so most likely you had like a bunch of questions and you're trying to reduce the complexity of those questions into like personality traits or like some type of stable construct. What did Johannes have you do? Personality, okay. <laughs> so the purpose of factor analysis is uh, usually you have a questionnaire and you want to see if there's some structure behind it, if you can reduce the complexity of it, and if there's some elements behind it, we capture it quite nicely. So we, wa we want to study the covariation between a large number of observed variables. They're also known as indicators. And then the question is how many latent factors would account for most variation among those variables? So if you do personality, you might have heard of the big five. Uh, I'm in camp big six, so I believe there are six personality factors. You also have people who believe there's a big two or a big one. So basically, we use person. Uh, so in the example of personality, we try to describe the entire variation in people's personality by these five or six dimensions, rather than 60 or 120 questions which we use to measure it. And we also want to find out which variables define each factor and uh, and labels we can give it. So basically, again, it's reducing complexity. So you know from the big five, you have extrovert and introversion as a dimension, you have openness to experience, you have those dimensions. And so ideally, uh, it would be great for us if a lot of variation in another variable is explained by this variable. So for example, if we know how, uh, how good people are at their job is explained by conscientiousness, then we only have to measure conscientiousness by this measure. So that's the ultimate goal. So usually factor analysis is the first step or we build some type of questionnaire measures and try to get the latent constructs, and then we use those latent constructs to predict something. So it's to reduce our complexity and uh, increase our understanding. And today we'll be doing exploratory factor analysis. The other side of the coin is confirmatory factor analysis. So sometimes if you're using, uh, if you're developing your, uh, your very own first skill, for example, on hoarding behavior or on gaming excitement or something which hasn't been researched yet, you will usually do a first exploratory factor analysis, reduce some of the items, and then the second step, you'll try and confirm uh, the factor structure and you'll do a confirmatory factor analysis. So it's a big uh, difference. So exploratory, the clues in the name, it's uh, uh, exploratory. So it's, uh, it means you don't have strong hypotheses necessarily about how many factors you would find. Uh, occasionally, you will have a very clear idea as to how many factors there should be, like big five, big six. These are the type of things you should recover. 
And in such a case, you would usually do confirmatory factor analysis because you sort of know the structure you're looking for. So for example, if you're doing intelligence and you think there's one factor called uh, G, then you would only look for that one factor called G and you would look for the item loadings on, on that. Uh, but commonly you have exploratory factor analysis first and then confirmatory factor analysis. So you might have thought, I'm not sure if with Johannes, whether you did principal component analysis or factor analysis, does that ring a bell? Did you, which one did you do? Did you do PCA or did you do proper factor analysis? Remember? PCA? So yeah, so quite confusingly, people use the same term factor analysis for both PCA and factor analysis. So uh, the idea of principal components is really like if you try to explain all the variation, like for example, you are so certain that your measure has captured 100% of variation, you would use PCA. So if you think those five dimensions of personality capture 100% of the variance, then you would use PCA. It's also a traditional and historical difference. Personality psychologists will have tended to use PCA more than people, for example, from sociology, who will have used factor analysis more. And so, so principal uh, components analysis finds a set of orthogonal standard linear combinations which together explain all of the variation in original data. So a big thing is, for example, if you feel that you are unable to capture that 100% of the data, so if you think, for example, there's some measurement noise, so for example, you're not doing personality, but you're doing musical tastes, and you're not, you feel like you're not able to capture all the different tastes that exist in society or all the different uh, variability you would have, then perhaps you wouldn't be using PCA, but you would be using factor analysis. So uh, my personal preference is to always use uh, factor analysis. And that's also why I'll be not talking a lot about PCA, because I think in general, it's quite unrealistic that you would have something which explains 100% variation in your data. So that even if you had a perfect factor combination, it's still quite a leap to say that would map on 100% and would explain all the variation you see in your data. So that's the big theoretical difference between those. Then you can read more if you read this Crawley book from 2013. So with principal component analysis, we're fundamentally interested in uh, the variables and their contributions. And factor analysis also allows us to give numerical values of uh, quantities such as intelligence or social status that are not directly measurable. So if you think something is really latent, then people are also more inclined. So if it's hidden, so to speak, if you can't observe it, for example, like intelligence, and people are more inclined also theoretically to pick factor analysis over principal component analysis. So uh, the idea is then that, that you can derive from uh, from those dimensions, you can derive scores, like from like for example intelligence, and you can use them later on in analyses, for example, for predicting outcomes in schools, bullying, all sorts of other things you might be uh, interested in. And so note here that I'm using factors, but factors, when I say it here, is something very different than when you have factors in your ANOVA. You remember a factorial ANOVA, where it meant like categories of uh, like a two by two is a factorial ANOVA, but that's a very different meaning of factor. And also in your data sets, you will have analysis, uh, you have variables which are factors. That's a very different definition than factors as in factor analysis. Yeah, is that? So that, that might confuse you a little bit, but uh, just so you, know, so you know. So something can be a factorial of the variable, but that is not the same as the terminology I'm using here for factor analysis. And all quite confusingly, sometimes people will say factor analysis when they're using PCA or vice versa. So it's it's very uh, uh, very confusing terminology also for me. But I will try to stick to factor analysis, just mean factor analysis, which means principles, actors, factoring, and meaning you are using trying not to explain all the variation you observe. So today, I'll mostly deal with factor analysis. If your supervisor, for some reason, wants you to use PCA, because that's the standard in their field, you will have some links on how to do it. So the math, the math behind it also, I'm not going to describe. Did Johannes describe all the math behind it? So basically, it's matrix algebra, and you have to solve matri matrices for eigenvalues to find optimal rotations. So I'm not going to delve into that, but if you're really into that, you can also click those sources to find out the matrix algebra as to how you do it. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, but for your purpose, I'm going to teach you again mostly how to apply it and how to interpret it, rather than teaching you the mathematics behind it. So factor analysis, like any statistical technique, comes with a bunch of assumptions. And in essence, everything is regression. <laughs> Everything, everything you ever encounter is very close or closely related to regression. 
And you can think of factor analysis as a sort of regression, which means similar assumptions apply. So all variables should be interval. So you can, and here it's slightly different. So you can't have any dummy variables. So you can't have gender, for example, or like any categorical variables in your factor analysis. That requires a different type of technique. Uh, and you can have no outliers. So you can have no extreme values. And all these variables should be interval. So for psychologists, mostly interval means measured on a 1 to 7 or a 1 to 9 scale. That's not really continuous, but it's what we've been using historically. Some people will do so also the factor analysis with a 1 to 5 scale. So, But you should be a little bit worried that the assumptions that go into this are that it's an interval variable, which means it's a continuously variable with like which follows a normal distribution. That's what we uh, want. The sample size, uh, again, you, we should be really wary with rules of thumb, but most people would say you need over 200 cases in order to do a factor analysis. Uh, it depends a little bit on the number of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of items. So if you have a very simple scale with only, let's say, 10 items or something, because it's regression, uh, you could sort of relax it and you could say, I'm having five to 10 cases for each arrow. You could think of them as arrows in a regression to estimate. So there's people who have argued against rules of thumb, like 200 or these five, uh, five to 10 cases per variable, because it will vary hugely depending on how well you've measured it, like how latent, like uh, if you have a one or two or three factor solution. So we should be a little bit worried with these rules of thumbs, but if, uh, if your supervisor asks you to come up with a number for how many people you should collect, you could say 200 minimum, and then perhaps five or 10 per, uh, per uh, variable. So we had normality. So uh, it's a little bit different for, uh, for uh, the assumptions are a little bit different for structural equation modeling, which is conformed to factor analysis than for export factor analysis. This is usually disregarded. So, so, it's not so it's not necessary to check, but it's good to know because if you're going to do a conformed to factor analysis in the next stage and it's not multivariate normal, you're going to run into problems no matter what. So multivariate normality, you might come, uh, you might remember that from when we did, uh, was it MANOVA? So we've done that type of assumption checking all, already. So because it's uh, regression, because we're rotating all these uh, all these things, uh, all the relationships are supposed to be linear. So you can't have curvilinear relationships, or you can't have exponential relationships. So if you think back to the data source, we expect all the relationships to be uh, linear in our model. And you should have some factorability. So if things, if none of your uh, questionnaires have done 60 questions, and if none of them correlate, you're going to have a very tough time building a scale. So there has to be some associations or meaningful associations between items in your questionnaire, because otherwise you can't build uh, a scale or you can't find this type of latent construct. And you can read more about the assumptions if you click down, if you click that link. Uh, any questions at this stage? So a bunch of assumptions. Again, I would wonder how often people always check all these assumptions. Uh, sometimes they don't, but it's good for you to know that they exist and that you should be uh, uh, doing this. So as uh, you've helpfully pointed out, that link, like this link still works, but the link behind it, which has the data is dead. But you can uh, get the data now because I've uploaded it. So it's personality zero dot text. Uh, I downloaded the data in my working directory. If you do the same, you can follow along. And then at first thing, I'm going to build like a uh, just a table, like using Stargaze to have a quick look. This is something which you will have done hopefully as well. So let's have a look at factor data. And so you could see the n. You could see the mean standard deviation. You could see the minimum and the maximum. And so from this, hopefully, you can drive. It was likely a one to nine scale, yeah. But some people didn't use the the max, and so you could sort of see the labels. You can already hint out that there's going to be personality related type of things, yeah, like uh, uh, kind, tense, agreeable, and you could see in this case we're quite lucky because it seems like all the n are the same, so it means there's no missing data in the set. Otherwise, if people had missing data, you would do what you've done before. You would either uh, reduce the data set or which imputes the, the missing data so you have a complete number of 240 or like at least all the numbers are equal because otherwise you're going to run into problems running your analyses. Yeah, so that's sort of what it looks at, looks like. If we go back, 
So that's just a very quick round of things. So there's, these are 240 participants providing self ratings on a 1 to 9 scale on 32 variables, so 32 traits. So the measurement and sample size are okay. We hit that magical 200 mark, so we had 240 uh, participants. Uh, it's 1 to 9, so you can always question how interval that really is. Uh, but it's better than 1 to 7, perhaps, and it's definitely better than 1 to 5. Uh, so it could be way worse. So it good, sounds good to me. So multivariate normality. This is not looking great. So we will ignore it for now, given that we're doing exploratory factor analysis. But you will run into problems. So you remember the MVM package. And so we can just, because there's no other things in this data set, we can just do multivariate normality test. And you can see from the outputs, highly significant. And the result in terms of both skewness and kurtosis and multivariate normality is that it isn't multivariate normal. Yeah. Again, you should be aware that some of these tests will be very easily significant with large sample sizes. So you'd also check visually, so, but you can sort of see uh, this is probably not good news. Like this type of thing is varying quite a lot of the line where we want it to, uh, to be. Yeah. So it's, and also it's like a systematic deviation. So, so the best thing is to sort of check visually and we're hoping that things would be close to the line, but in this case, they're not. So in this case, we might have some problem with multivariate, multivariate normality but we're going to soldier on anyway. We're going to do and see what it gives. Linearity. So uh, you can do, so because all these associations have to be linear, it's quite difficult, but you can do, uh, you can check that visually. You can do pairwise scatter plots and sort of see if you get a linear pattern. But because it's one to nine, you get these type of uh, things. So it's not very useful. So we can also, uh, we'll just assume linearity, which is reasonable. And we're also helped a little bit again by our central limit theorem. So the, the larger our sample sizes, uh, the, we, uh, the larger sample sizes, the, the less we'll have to worry about deviations from uh, from linearity and this type of things because we're going to get closer and closer. Our uh, like our sums will become more and more robust to deviations from these uh, 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 linearity. Okay, so this is our friend the Bartlett test, which you also remember, which you did when you were doing Anavus. And here, actually, so you remember that we were doing that for homogeneity of variances. And here, actually, you want it to be significant because it's a proxy for, like, there are correlations in our data. So if there is no correlations in our data, then this test will not be significant. But here, we want it to be significant. So this is a, a test for whether it's factorable, so to speak, or not factorable. So if it's not significant, or then you have a problem because it means there are no meaningful correlations between your items, which means it's going to be very difficult for you to build scales out of it. So if you were to write this up to say, oh, this was support, you would say a Bartlett's test for sphericity was significant, suggesting that factor analysis is appropriate. And then they, these are the values you have from that output before. Yeah. So uh, another way to uh, assess this, this is known as the Kaiser-Meyer uh, Olkin factor adequacy uh, test, or the KMO test. Uh, and that ranges from zero to one, and you want them to all be above 0.5 for every single item. So we, here we have our 32 items, and this one is the average. So we call the site package, and it's just single command KMO. Again, be aware that this data set should only contain things which you're doing your factor analysis on. So if it still has variables in it like gender or something like that, it's not gonna work. So it needs only the things which you're building your factor analysis on to test those assumptions. So you can see most of them are quite good. They're definitely above 0.5, some of them are uh, quite high, so 0 to 1. And you have some beautiful terminology, so you have 0 to 0 0.49 unacceptable, 0 0.5 to 0 0.59 miserable, mediocre, middling, meritorious, and marvelous. I always just like to say we have a marvelous solution in order to do factor analysis, but those are the terms they suggested. I highly recommend you use those terms so they stay in the scientific literature, so you can say all 32 items show middling to meritorious uh, uh, adequacy for the, the factor analysis because we went with the lowest one, which is the 0.72. Yeah. But you also have the average one. So if you wanted to make yourself look better, you could take the average one. But here I described the full range. OK. So that's a sample right of us to I say. So we had two tests to sort of say that we have some things there in order to do factor analysis. So that is factorable. So now you can try it for yourself with, with a different data set. So you need to use right click and uh, you have, these are data, uh, uh, these data are ratings of instructors from a study by Sidanius. So they're teachers like me uh, and they're being judged by students. 
and you can read in the data, so you will have to save it in your working directory. And then, because this data set has more than what you're after, you need a subset with uh, the items 13 to 24. And you, if you re recall, you can use select in order to do that from the dplyr function. And then you can conduct this KMO test. So I don't want you to do all the other things. Just do that KMO test, which I just did, like, and see if it's meritorious, marvelous, or mediocre, or miserable. And that's what I would like you to do.